Welcome and good afternoon. Uh, this is Andy Hecht. I'm the editor in chief here at Option Hotline. And I'd like to welcome everyone to the Option Hotline webinar series, today featuring Dr. Duke, Kerry Given, PhD, the founder of Parkwood Capital. Dr. Duke offers stock and options coaching, a weekly newsletter, and three trading advisory services. Dr. Duke has over three decades trading experience and has been trading options for over two decades. Today, Dr. Duke will offer his expertise on playing the earnings announcement. If you have any questions for Dr. Duke, please type them into the chat area and we'll try to get to them at the end of the presentation. So please take it away. Welcome, Kerry. Welcome, Dr. Duke. Are you there? I am here. Thank you, awesome. Andy. Awesome. So take it away. Okay, we'll do. Okay, does so everybody see my slide okay? Hopefully that's coming through. We're going to yep, be talking looks about. Good, Duke. Okay, good. Thank you for having me today. We're going to be talking about one of my favorite speculative trades. Generally speaking, I'm a pretty conservative trader, but I have a few speculative trades that I dabble with. And one of those is playing earnings announcements. As we all know, maybe from bad experiences where we were holding a stock for years and everything seemed to be fine, and then suddenly at one of the earnings announcements, it collapsed for some reason. So those are the types of trades we're going to be talking about. But before I get into that, we have to have the lawyers take care of, taken care of. These are the disclosures and disclaimers that we need to represent. I can summarize this very simply. Anytime you're trading, doesn't matter if it's stocks, options, commodities, financials, bonds, whatever it might be, there's always, there will always be losses. Oftentimes we say there will always be a risk of a loss, but there will always be losses, period. And the name of the game is risk management so that you always maintain your losses at a level that's lower than your gains. And it's just that simple. So just keep that in mind as you get into this kind of trading or any kind of trading that you're talking about. As I mentioned before, I don't trade these type of trades very often. So I'm not suggesting that this is something you ought to be tackling as your main trade. Probably 5% of my trading counts is the most I ever have on these types of trades. The reason for that is these are what I call binary trades. In other words, they're either, you're either right or you're wrong. They either go your way or they don't. You don't really have any occasion or opportunity to adjust them. A lot of the trades that I do normally, most of my trading, I may put it on assuming a stock is gonna trade sideways, for example, and it starts trading down and I have to adjust things. I did this recently with a iron condor on Amazon, or not Amazon, but AutoZone, AZO is a ticker. And I started out thinking it was gonna trade sideways and it just fell out of bed and I kept adjusting downward and we finally ended up with a 10% gain, but it was after several adjustments. These trades, by contrast, don't allow you that opportunity, that luxury, if you will. So the main, you sh main thing you should focus on with these trades is what is your maximum loss on that particular trade? And then decide what's the most that I feel comfortable losing on any one trade in my portfolio. In other words, if you've looked at your portfolio and said, I can afford to lose a thousand bucks. Then if you're looking at one of these trades that we're gonna talk about today, and it has maximum loss of $250, you might trade four of those contracts. And that way, even if everything goes against you, you won't lose any more than what you'd set out as your maximum to start with, that you can absorb in your normal trading without a long-term hit. So, when we're talking about an earnings announcement, there's two very different perspectives. If I'm very familiar with this stock and I've followed it for a long time, maybe own the stock, then I probably know a lot about it and I probably have a directional prediction 
I'm convinced it's going to go higher or I think it's going to fall out of bed or, or whatever. On the other hand, I may have no idea where this thing's going, either because of a lot of conflicting information that I'm getting or I'm just not that familiar with the stock. So in one case, I need a directional trade. In other words, I mean, a simple one is I'm bullish and I just buy a call. In the other case, I need a non-directional trade. I need something that will have a, a range of profitability basically for the stock trading sideways within that range. But before I decide on what trade I want to use, I need to do some homework. For example, first question, what is the market expecting? Now, you might listen to that question and think, well, how would I know? What do you mean, what is the market expecting? Well, I thought the same thing Many years ago, I remember watching a financial news program and they were discussing Apple and the earnings announcement was coming up. And one of the people on this program said, well, the market's expecting a 5% move. And I remember thinking, well, how does he know that? Who told him that? Well, I looked into it and what they do is they simply price the at the money strangle. In other words, buy a call at the money and buy a put at the money. You've bet on both directions. Now, when you look at that trade and you just simply compute the break-even on each end, break-even on the high side, break-even on the low side, that gives you an expected price range. Because in effect, the prices of those options have been bid up to the levels that they are that reflect the overall consensus of the market, of the people making those trades. When the price gets too high, nobody buys any more of those calls. Consequently, it kind of stabilizes there and you have a high end of the range. Same thing with the puts. So that's the first data point. What's the expected price range just based on current trading? Then look at the past. Go back and analyze all of the earnings announcements for the past year and just tabulate, it went up 5%, went down 10%, went up 3%, whatever. Average those out. Don't worry about the direction, just average out the absolute numbers. That gives you an average range or average percentage move, which gives you an average range based on today's stock price for this particular stock. So it gives you another expected price range. It might be bigger than the first one we did based on the current trading of the options, or it might be smaller. Now, the next point is your judgment. When you look at that, and based on what you know about the stock, do you think the expected range is too large? Has everybody gotten all hyped up with this thing and it's just, it's overstated? Or you think it's just the opposite? They're all hyped up and you think it's not gonna do much. So that's an important data point that only you can provide. The next thing I look at is what has been the price movement recently? especially as you approach the day of the earnings announcement, if it's been steadily moving higher, that may be a signal. Maybe somebody knows something here. And so all of these things give you an idea of what kind of trade you might want to make. Let's say you want to, you are feeling directional. You, you have a basic bullish bias or a basic bearish bias. Well, you can satisfy that in a lot of different ways. You could just buy a call or buy a put. The problem with that is those calls and puts are very expensive because they've been bid up by all the hype around this announcement. And of course, after the announcement, the implied volatility collapses. And so that means those prices of those options collapse. And so that makes it kind of tough to buy that call or buy that put and profit. You can also buy a diagonal call spread and I'll be talking about this one more in a moment, where I simply go out farther in time and buy a call and sell a near-term call. Now, what I'm doing is I'm selling an option that's very expensive because of this earnings announcement and reducing the price of the call that I own. Now, this is a bullish trade, so this is directional. If that, tr if that underlying stock trades sideways or higher, we'll make money. 
But if it trades down, if it collapses, we'll lose. Two other possibilities is to buy a butterfly out of the money. Could be either higher or lower, whichever direction you're betting on. Or a broken wing butterfly. That's a more of an in-between, but it kind of leans one way or the other. Let's talk more about that diagonal spread. First of all, I sell, I set up to sell the at the money call in the nearest expiration I have that includes the earnings announcement. In other words, if the earnings are going to be announced uh, Wednesday after the market closes, then if that option or that stock rather has weekly options, you want the option that's going to expire on Friday. You want the option that is most hyped up by this earnings announcement. So that's when you sell. You go out to a farther expiration, could be the next week, could be the next month, and you buy an in the money option. So you've got a spread, five or $10 spread. That expensive short term option is serving you well because it's reducing your cost in this trade. Because remember, whatever debit you put this trade on for is your maximum loss. Put another way, if it goes positive in your favor, that's the cost of that long call. And if that long call is appreciating greatly because this thing zooms up after the announcement, you own that long call at a pretty cheap price. So it helps you in that respect. Now, a couple of things that I always check, there's two main criteria that I check because I don't do this diagonal call spread on earnings announcements very often. First one is I look at the lower break-even price. I compare that to the price chart for the stock. Typically, you look at one of the one of the dips that's happened in the past three, four, five, six months. In other words, stock traded down to 55 bucks. Well, where is my lower break-even for this diagonal spread? I would want it to be below that. Fifty dollars would be ideal because that gives me a little feeling that maybe I have a pretty good safety margin to the downside. The second point that you have to make sure is there is that your debit for this trade is less than the spread width. So if I've got a spread that's say $10 across, you know, I bought a 50 and sold a 60. Well, then that's a $10 spread, so that's $1,000. And I want to put that trade on for less than a thousand dollars. That way I'm always in a good position. If that stock zooms up, just takes off dramatically to the upside, I will always be able to get out with a profit. If I pay more than a spread, then I'm subject to a loss if it goes up too fast, too, too high and too fast. So those are the two requirements before this makes sense. I typically find that only, oh, I don't know, maybe three or four times a year will I find uh, stocks that set up this way, that satisfy both those. Now, what about if we're looking at this and we believe that the price move is likely to be larger than that expected range? Well, how do I play that? If I'm not really directional, if I don't know which way it's going, I could either buy a straddle where I buy an at to money call and buy an at to money put, or I could buy a strangle where I move a little bit out of the money and buy the call, out of the money and buy the put. The advantage of the strangle is it's cheaper. Those are cheaper options. This advantage is it's a little bit wider break even range. In other words, you need a bigger move to make money. Now, what if you think just the opposite? You think the price move is going to be less than what's expected. Well, then you could sell a straddle or sell a strangle, just do the opposite. The problem with that is you have unlimited risk in both directions. Or you could hedge it in effect. When you sell an iron condor where I sell a call spread up above the stock price and sell a put spread down below the stock price, I've effectively hedged a strangle. Because remember the strangle, if I sold that, I just sell the call out of the money and sell the put out of the money. Well, if I move a little farther out of the money on either one of those and buy a call and buy a put, I've hedged my risk on that side. So I no longer have an unlimited risk trade. 
What about if I think we're going to have a larger move? In other words, I don't think the price move is going to be within that expected range. I think it's going to go outside of it. Well, then buying the straddle or the strangle is the way to go. Now, we create the straddle by buying an add money call and add money put. Now, if I add up the prices for that, whatever I spend for that straddle, and just add that to the strike price and subtract it from the strike price, that gives me the break-evens. And so the reason you need to compute that and know where it is is because you need this stock to move outside of those, higher than that upper break-even and lower than the lower break-even. That's how you make money. Same thing with the strangle. Only difference there is it's going to be a smaller amount of money because those are cheaper options, but you're still going to have those break-even prices, which will be a little farther out. Now, the problem with this trade, either one of these trades, buying a straddle or buying a strangle, is we're doing it with very expensive options. Implied volatility is through the roof. For something like Apple or Google, Netflix, these options are probably, they probably have implied volatility of 100% or more. It'll be very expensive. As soon as the event occurs, if it's after the market closes today, tomorrow when the market opens up, the implied volatility on those options will just collapse. It'll go from 100% to 60 and then down to 30 maybe before the day is over. They'll drop dramatically. Well, the problem with that is it leaves you in a tough place. Let's say that, that uh, you, let's say you did this on Google. Google opens up the next morning way up. It goes up 30 bucks, 40 bucks. Well, your call is making a lot of money based on that big increase in the stock price, but your call is also losing money because the implied volatility has dropped so much. Well, your put is losing money on both counts. The price moved the opposite way and implied volatility collapsed. So in other words, to make money with a straddle or a strangle, the positive price move that you achieved with one of your options has to be so big, so profitable, that it offsets the loss in volatility in that option and offsets the fact that the other option is basically worthless. And that's why selling or buying rather the straddle or the strangle is a tough trade to make money on. But what if we go the other way? What if we think the price move is going to be less than the expected move? Well, you could sell the straddle or strangle, but we already pointed out that's an unlimited risk. So we could sell an iron condor. Now we've hedged the risk, but we were left with a tougher question. Where do we position these spreads? How far out do I need to go? Where is safe? And so that's what we have to figure out. Now, one fellow that I know, and I would recommend you look at his book, it's a fairly cheap, it's an e-book, nine bucks on Amazon. Royal Ellinger is the author's name. I forget what he titles it, but you can find it just based on searching on his name. But Royal and I, we know each other quite well. And um, he's been doing this by selling out of the money strangles for years. And the beauty of his book is he, book, he documents all of his trades for several years and shows you why he's changed his rules as time's gone on. Now he basically sets up his strangles based on one, uh, one standard deviation each direction. But he's just selling the strangle. So remember, one of the things here you have to remember is this is an unlimited risk trade. And so, in his case, he has a large account that he's doing this with, but he's trading each, he's trading a lot of strangles with a small amount risk on each one. Now he's put on several different rules. One of them is he only trades with stocks that have large daily trading volume. And he has his so-called do not trade list, which are basically stocks that through the years he's decided just are too erratic. Stocks like Netflix, for example, Google, 
they're not they're on his do not trade list but the positive news is he has a positive profitable track record over five years so that's worth looking at if you're thinking about selling strangles on earnings announcements I prefer to sell the condor because that way I'm hedged and I I don't do very many of these in a year, but I prefer this trade of the ones that we've talked about. So how do we position those two condors, the two spreads in the condor? First of all, we price that straddle at the money. That gives us a expected range, expected price range. Then we look at the past several earnings announcements. We get an average percentage gain there or percentage move and that gives us another range. Mike think of that as the historical information. Then I calculate one and two standard deviation moves for that stock. Now the last point is a little more a little more in realm of your judgment call. And that is what what is the minimum credit that you're going to receive that you'll accept? Because what you find here is you'll have some expected range that you'll settle on based on these calculations. And you'll say, well, I want to be outside of $150 on this side and below $80 on this side or something like that. Well, you look at the credits for those two spreads and you think, well, Gads, I'm only going to get five cents on each side or something. And you might say, well, that doesn't make sense. That's not worth my time. I'm taking entirely too much risk to make $5. So you throw that one away. And in fact, an awful lot of the time, I don't play the majority, probably 80%, maybe 90% of the earnings announcement trades that I look at, I don't play simply because there's not enough money. It's a trade-off because obviously, this, if you've got spreads on each side of this thing that are looking at like five bucks credit, well, the other flip side of that is it has a very high probability of those options expiring worthless. But the negative part of that is yes, there's a high probability of a small gain, but there's a very low probability of a very large loss. And I don't like that balance. If you trade it with a little more credit involved, a little richer trade in other words, you've got a better chance of perhaps being able to adjust one side or the other or close one side and be closer to break even because you've got a good credit on the other side. But in any case, that's the final judgment call that you have to make. So let me show you some examples from last year. In our trading group, we, trade, we traded 25 of these trades last year. So let's look at this one first. This, before I talk about this, let me explain the diagram. On the right-hand side of the screen, you can see it's the classic risk-reward diagram for an iron condor, but it's turned on its side. What you're used to seeing is kind of this uh, stovetop hat uh, diagram shape, but the top of the hat is usually at the top of the screen instead of being at the right side of the screen like it is here. I like this, this piece of software that I use to draw these allows you to do it either the classical way or this way where you turn the risk reward curve on its side and put the stock price chart on the left. The beauty of this is I can go over here at the stock price chart and say, well, look at here back uh, in late December, this stock was down at what, about $142. And then I can run straight across the screen and say, well, at 142, I'd still be profitable. So that's why I like this, this particular type of software. And that's on the right-hand side on the risk reward curve, that black line is the profit or loss at each stock price at expiration. The red line is today, whichever date you're plotting this, excuse me. And then it divides the time to expiration in thirds. So the blue line is a third in, green line is two thirds in. And so you see the effect of the time decay with those curves. So Apple here is at about 155 bucks. The next day it opens up at 163 and, eight, and even runs even a little higher than that. 
So I ended up closing the calls, call spread on that side, ended up with a 5% gain. Now this is a good example, whereas if I had waited two or three days, those calls would have expired worthless as well. But it jumped up enough here and traded higher during the day, right after the announcement, that I didn't want to hold on to this thing. I could close it now, close the call spreads now, let the puts expire worthless and get a gain. And so that's what I did. Here's an Amazon play we did in February. Now look at that price chart. This thing is a, Amazon prices just go up and down all the time. It's a crazy stock. You can see where we positioned these uh, spreads, way above and way below the price. Gave it a lot of room. As it turned out, it dropped the next day, but not too badly. And both sides of our options expired worthless, so we ended up with a 17% gain overnight. Here's Netflix, positioned that one pretty wide, pretty far out on both sides. Next day, Netflix didn't move very much. Unusual for that one. So again, both sides of our trade expired worthless, 18% gain. But they don't all turn out positive. Here's our Google trade back in May. Look at where this thing went. It was at about uh, oh, 1290, I guess, before the earnings announcement. Opened up here at 1191. Wow, huge move. Now notice that I put this on, the credit for the Condor was $201. It's $10 spread, so it means 799 was my maximum loss. And I took a loss of 779, almost 100% loss. So this is, remember what I was talking before, these trades are typically binary in that you either win or you lose. And they're also classic high probability trades where you're getting a relatively small gain, but you have a low probability of a large loss. Now here you see all of the earnings trades that we did in the trading group last year, 25 of them. And a majority, you can go down through that list and want to have one, two, three, four, had six of them that were diagonal spreads, diagonal call spreads. Majority were condors. 88% win loss ratio, so we did pretty well. If you just average up the gains percentage wise for each of these trades, it comes out to be about 11%. If you look at the net P&L, in other words, just add up the dollars for each one of these, you end up with a a profit of 515 bucks, just trading one contract in each one of these trades. But notice something, we only had three losses all year, but one was for 97%, one was for 55%, and one was for 100%. Not trivial losses. So that's why when you play these, you need to be sure that you're not betting the farm on one of these trades because you won't have the farm. But if you manage your risk properly, your gains are gonna outweigh your losses. And that's the proper way that risk management should help you. So in summary, there's a lot of different ways you can play earnings announcements and I've only presented you a couple but they're the ones that I find in my own trading, my own judgment, that I like and I use. I'm not saying they're the only way to do it. But just keep in mind, use your basic money management principles to control your risk. In other words, decide what is the maximum loss I wanna take on any one trade in my portfolio. And then be sure when you're pricing out that condor or that diagonal spread, Figure out what is the maximum loss here. In the case of the diagonal spread, it's just simply the debit that you put on for that first trade. Make sure that you size that so that your maximum loss is not gonna kill you. With the condor, just, it's just the opposite. 
you put it on for a credit, subtract that credit from the spread width, and that's your maximum loss on the condor. So if that means you only put on one spread or two, fine. But that way you know what your risk is and you can survive it. Now remember, <clears throat> I showed you many different ways that you can compute the market's estimated range here. Now the interesting thing about that is there's several academic studies. You can do some homework on this and you'll find several academic studies coming out of various business schools in the country where they go back and they simply price the expected range for all of these earnings announcements every year, every quarter for every year. Do it over a long period of time. And then they compare that expected price range with the actual move. What they find, that they will differ, each academic study will be a little bit different, but they typically run about 85% of the actual moves are within the expected range. In other words, only about 15% of the time does it pop out of that range one way or the other. That's why the straddle is a hard way to make money on this because only about 15% of the time does it really move for you in your favor. Now, you compare that to Royal's track record, his track record over five years is 83% wins. So in other words, both his track record and mine for last year are very similar to what these ac academic studies are coming up with. What that tells you is that if you're playing these moves by basically betting on the move being within the range, within the expected range, you may have an edge. I would say you do have an edge. So with that, I certainly can answer questions. You've got my uh, email address there and phone number if you want to call or drop me a note. Questions? Hi, Dr. Duke. It's Andy. How are you um, doing, Andy? I'm good. Thank you, first of all, for, for, for the presentation. I have, um, I have just a couple of quick ones, uh, maybe clarifications or, or just, just quick, quick questions. Um, you know, I'm, I'm more of a fundamentalist. I, I, I just wonder, how, do you look at analyst estimates in terms of ranges for uh, earnings uh, from a fundamental perspective or, or do you just take a very mathematical objective kind of one to two standard deviation approach to these types of trades? I, I lean on just kind of the mathematics. Um, I do, I pay attention to analysts commentary before the announcement, primarily to get a sense of whether, in my opinion, this particular stock earnings announcement is getting overhyped. I mean, for example, with a stock like Apple, it varies. Sometimes their earnings announcement is boring and everybody's bored in advance. Other times it is just, everybody is all over the map and it's all hyped up and consequently, there's a lot of implied volatility. And sometimes I just don't play those because I feel like they're just too dangerous. But other than that, I'm pretty much just doing it by the math. Makes sense. I, I assume, that, this is just a clarification, I assume that you tend to use the nearest options expiration date uh, when it comes to expiration on, on these types of, of structures. That's right. That's right. Because that gives you the highest implied volatility, which... Generally, that's what you want because with the iron condor, it's a negative Vega trade. So as the volatility collapses, that helps you. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's what you want. Great. Okay. And the final question that I have is, you know, when it comes to risk reward, I, I, I understand the probability of, of these trades is very high. Um, is there any guide you can give any of the attendees or, or, or you know, about what kind of risk reward ratio is like your sweet spot, is it five to one risk reward, 10 to one, 20 to one? Is there a level where you'll kind of walk away from the trade? Yes, yes, there is. I, you know, I, I know some people when they put these kind of trades on, they're, they're actually more comfortable the cheaper the credit. In other words, if you're putting on a condor, they're saying, well, I'm, I'm selling this thing for $5, therefore it's 100%, it's in the bag, I'm gonna make my five bucks. And I, I avoid that because I feel like it, if it just twitches against you, you're going to lose that $5 and $20 more. Um, on the other hand, if you get it a richer credit, 
obviously your probabilities are going down. And so it becomes kind of a judgment call of where you're comfortable there. I typically, for these condors that I sell before the earnings announcement, I typically will pass on the trade if I can't see a potential gain of about 20%. If it's more than that, I start to worry about it maybe being not as probable, not as high probabilities I would like. If it's lower than that, I just feel like, you know, that's, it just, um, I'm not getting much credit and there's a pretty good chance that maybe a little bit of move against me, like in that Google case, it'll just wipe me out. I get it, makes, makes a lot of sense. So I wanna thank you so much, Dr. Duke. The presentation was enlightening and I think we all learned a lot. Uh, you can check out Dr. Duke's commentator page on optionhotline.com and learn more about both him and his products. And I wanna take this opportunity to thank all of the attendees and to thank Dr. Duke. And please make sure to check out optionhotline.com for upcoming webinars and podcasts. So thank you, Kerry. Appreciate your uh, presence here today. My pleasure. Thank you, Andy. Thank you. And we look forward to having you back again. Again, the website is optionhotline.com. Have a great day, everyone. This concludes the webinar.